Hello everybody, my name's Lauren and I am part of the learning team at the London Transport Museum. Today I am joined by three of our lovely STEM ambassadors from TFL and Siemens and we're going to be talking things engineering and sustainability. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to ask each of my ambassadors to introduce themselves. They're going to tell you their name, their job title, and what they actually do, what that job title means. So first of all, Ben, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Emma. I am a project manager working for Transport for London. Um, and if you don't know what a project manager is, that basically means that I'm the the planning and execution of a particular project. I always say that if you know what it takes to make a good cake, you know what it takes to manage a project. So you need to prepare properly, like making sure you have all your ingredients and all your tools ready before you start. And then you follow your recipe and your time plan carefully to make sure the cake is ready to serve with enough time. So I do all of this, but with railways. So it's pretty similar, except it takes much, much longer. And sadly, you can't eat the railway at the end. Uh, Disney now. Hi, my name's Disney. I'm an account manager at Siemens Mobility Limited. Um, my job basically uh, entails that I have frequent engagements with a customer, uh, mainly TFL, to understand the sort of issues that the customer wants to uh, solve in terms of public transport and also in terms of um, how they want to improve mobility in London. Uh, so um, key skills um, in my day-to-day -day job are understanding um, technical side of, of the issues, uh, having good communication skills and be able to digest a lot of information uh, to be able to transfer it back to the business to make sure that we are ready and we have solutions that we can offer to the customer to help make their visions become reality. Over to Ben. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Ben. I, I, I work for Transport for London, uh, the same as Emma. I'm a, a, a rail vehicles engineer, which, which means I work in trains, like the tube train you might have been to if you've been up to London. Um, so I work to maintain the trains that we, that Transport for London run on our network. So when things break on the train or to, uh, to keep them running as, as well, like just like your car that you would look after, you would clean them, you would um, make sure uh, things are running smoothly, then I am um, an engineer that looks after the trains. Um, that's, my, that's my role. Back to Lauren. Great. So we've met our three uh, engineers, and as you can see, they all work in quite different areas, which is really useful. Um, but I think the first question I'm going to ask them is because you might be asking yourself, is what actually is an engineer? So I'm going to ask our ambassadors to tell us what they what they would say to someone that says, "Well, what is an engineer? What is engineering?" So Disney, you maybe want to kick us off and tell me what you would say to that. I think um, an engineer is very different things to very different people. Um, when I was much, much younger, uh, I used to watch my grandpa fix uh, sort of broken electronic devices. So people would used to bring him broken radios, broken TVs, and he would just trial and error sort of different mechanisms and different methods until he made them work again. And that was always quite fascinating to me, sort of thinking, wow, he can sort of bring all these things back to life, um, troubleshoot all the issues. Things. And when I went on to university and sort of was exploring what I could do with my career, I understood that that was mainly what an engineer does, is sort of understanding what what issues are, how you can find proper processes and proper methods to, to fix these issues and also improve and make sure you can pioneer new things into, into different industries. So that really inspired me to, to try and understand how public transport could be more green, more sustainable and you know more accessible for everyone that needs to use it.
Great. So and same thing to you. Someone asks you, what is an engineering? What is it all about? What would you say to them? Yeah, so I, I think a huge part of my job is problem solving. So maybe um, something on the train needs repairing. And so there's, and there's lots of different ways that we could fix that component. Um, and so the, the task of the engineer is to think about all the different ways that we could fix this, this problem, um, thinking about how much it costs, how much time it's going to take to repair that item, um, what sort of, uh, when we've repaired it, then what does it affect on the rest of the train? Will we be able to fit that repaired item back to the, uh, back in the same place or do we need to make other modifications? So the huge part of what I would say an engineer is, is, is problem solving um, and thinking very clearly about the whole train and the whole system altogether. Um, so yeah, for me then it's, it's problem solving, that's how I'd round it up. Uh, what about you, Emma? Oh, I, I totally agree with both of you, actually. I, for me, the essence of engineering is the problem solving. And the problems that we solve as engineers, they are on so many scales. So they, you know, they're at, at, they're from the level of, you know, turning some screws to fix a radio to, well, hang on, you know, how do we get, you know, 100,000 people a day from this side of London to this side of London? And, you know, I, I, I work at, at this sort of scale where I'm looking at the, the how do we get the people from one side of London to the other side of London problem. And the solution that we're looking at as engineers is, well, we'll build a new railway. We'll build a railway like Crossrail 1, which is being built at the moment and is nearly finished, or Crossrail 2, which is a railway that, you know, nobody's put any spades in the ground yet to build this. <laughs> but it's something that we're looking at to solve this problem. And, you know, my contribution to that as, as an engineer myself and now as a project manager is I would be looking at how to break the problem down into smaller problems. So I'd say, right, well, we need to build the structure of the railway, all the concrete bits that go in the grounds that you can put the tracks in the tunnels and you can put escalators in the stations. So I'd hire a structural engineer for that. But then I need, I need to hire someone maybe from Siemens like Disney to think about how all the signaling for the railway works so the trains don't crash into each other. And then I need to go find someone like Ben <laughs> to sort out the actual trains themselves. So you see how for engineering at all levels, you get these problems from the tiniest, tiniest problems to the biggest problems. And if you stick all the tiny problems together and solve those, then you solve the overall engineering problem. And uh, that's that's the thing I actually like most about engineering, that scalability. <laughs> oh, back to you, Lauren, for the next question. <laughs> That's great. So actually, what our ambassadors um, have done a really good job there of is touching on this idea that I think we, a lot of us, when we think of engineering, we think of maybe building buildings or building cars or making things work like that. But what I really like about their answers is they've all touched on the fact that actually there's a lot of skills and a lot of aspects to engineering that I think would surprise a lot of people. So team working, for example, we've just heard how even if you're working on a project, you're not working on it as an individual, as a little island. You're having to consider lots of different departments, lots of different aspects. And in fact, your project fits into a whole other range of other project so that's something i want to now talk about with my engineers is maybe what surprised you about being an engineer in terms of what would maybe a skill or part of your job that you maybe hadn't expected when you first thought yes i want to go into engineering something that you ended up going oh well actually i'm really going to need a skill and that surprised me or i'm going to be you know working in this way which really surprised me let's start with emma thank you lauren so I, I was thinking quite hard about this one, actually, and there's been quite a few things that actually surprised me about being an engineer. And I, I thought at the outset, you know, having having gone to university and then joined an engineering consultancy before I worked for TFL, that I'd spend all my time, you know, sitting down, doing calculations in front of spreadsheets, you know, never really talking to anyone. And and that's just not the case. <laughs> it's a it's a, a kind of weirdly people oriented profession where you have to deal with so many what we call interfaces um, and you have to 
the way you deal with that is by talking to people and agreeing things. And you, you do these things like design workshops where you sit down in a room with 15 people all from different disciplines. So you might have mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and structural engineers, and then even the architects and <laughs> and the drainage engineers and the uh, the environmental consultants and the, the sustainability engineers. And you all get together to try and solve a problem. And I, I don't know why, but I never quite understood that that's that's really how these things are dealt with in in the real engineering world it's not just sitting in front of your computer doing calculations well there is a little bit of that uh, but it's also about interacting with people to find the best solution to a problem um, don't know what you think about that Ben <laughs> anything to add yeah no I I, I agree um, I'm I'm the same I thought um obviously studied science and maths at school and I, and I really enjoyed that that sort of side of, of school and then that led into to university um, and then it's easy to to believe that engineering you will be just somehow right you know doing questions in a textbook um, but that's not the case it is as you say uh, a lot of interaction with other people particularly Particularly, I think one of the most difficult skills is when you disagree, actually. Two engineers disagree on what we should do. Um, <clears throat> they present their reasons why uh, each of their ideas is, is better. And you've got to try and come to an agreement about which one we're going to go forward with. You can't, we can't sit there in a room and, uh, and not go anywhere. You have to resolve uh, the, the conflict. Um, and I think that is possibly one of the most difficult skills that I, uh, I have to sort of try and um, develop in my uh, in my career as an engineer I think it's a really tricky one uh, but uh, yeah quite a surprise probably uh, when you come into engineering that that is is what you spend your time some of your time doing anyway there's, there's plenty of calculations as well but uh, what, about, what about you Disney? I agree with both of you um quite a lot to be fair, because I think at least in, in pop culture and, and sort of, you know, media depictions, engineers are sort of these sad creatures that are just in a cubicle, trotting away, doing calculus, sort of talking to themselves. But um, in, in, in both of my previous roles and in my current role as Siemens, that is definitely not the case, uh, especially in the day-to-day -day job I do, where before COVID, <laughs> I used to be uh, in front of the customer and speaking to various different people from different parts of the business. Um, and I think one of the most tricky skills that I've had to develop over the years is being able to talk to different people in a sort of different engineering language. Um, when you're talking to the bid management team, is very different than being able to speak to R&D engineers or you know solutions architects. So is finding the right balance and the right language to, to be able to communicate efficiently with all of these teams by still translating the same message across. So I find that quite tricky, but also quite rewarding to be able to sort of link all these different teams and messages from the customers back into, into the internal organization. So fully agree with everything that Emma and Ben just said. Great, some great answers there. And actually, I want to just pick up a couple of the points that our different ambassadors made. So and I think a big thing that came out of that was actually how important having people and communication skills is as an engineer. I think what we need to remember is, that, as they all said, you are going to be doing some equations and you're going to be using your maths and science. However, when you are building a building, when you're building a transport network, whatever you're doing, you are creating these things for people to use. So right at the heart of everything an engineer does is people, because we're not just building a building that we're all going to look at and never go inside. We have to make sure that it can be used by people. So you're really having to not just talk to lots of other departments and try and work out how you all get what you want, but also think about the whole time, how does this affect people and I think that's really really important and I think what they've all picked up on a little bit there is the ability to think quite creatively so as Ben said sometimes you're going to have different people in a project that think different solutions work better or 
um, need different things from the project. You know, one person might be looking after more the financial side. So they're going to have different concerns and different priorities. And being able to think creatively, being able to go, well, hang on, I need to fit all these different pieces into place and make it all work well is a really, really important thing. Now, I know that all three of our ambassadors went down um, the going to university route to get into the career. And that's something I just want to talk about. It is a career where you can go through university and there's a whole range of different types of engineering. We've heard a little bit from all of them. They mentioned things, you know, you've got things like material engineering, chemical engineering. Remember, engineers are also designing your computer games. They're designing ready meals. They are creating huge massive building projects but they're also creating medical instruments and things like that so there's a whole range of areas you can study at university going to different types of engineering however something that's really exciting about engineering is if you are not so much wanting to go down the academic route you can go through apprenticeship schemes and TfL has an amazing apprenticeship scheme for engineers I myself go to university you know it's not the all and end all there are lots of different ways you can get into the careers you want to get into so um don't put off if you think oh wait, i have to go and get a degree that's not the case at all now i want to pick up on something our engineers started to touch on and this was a, this idea of um considering all the different things that are going to affect your project now obviously with these being tfl and siemens engineers working on london projects have to consider London as a city but creating projects in London is going to be very different to doing it say in Devon or doing it somewhere internationally like Sydney or Singapore so what I want to ask my uh, ambassadors is how do you find London specifically influences what you do as an engineer what Kind of things are you having to consider that maybe you wouldn't have to consider or wouldn't be the same kind of problem elsewhere? I'm going to start question off with Disney. Yeah, I think London is quite an interesting uh, test bed for some other cities or other towns across the UK and even internationally. Um, it's always striving to try out new things, new technologies. Um, and new concepts, really. Um, I think we've seen a lot of strides on the signaling front, on London Underground. Uh, we've also mobility projects um, around connected autonomous vehicles and the trials around that and e-scooters. So I think it's always pushing the barrier to, to sort of understand what the future of public transport might look like. And it sort of sets the theme for other cities to, to follow suit. So, it's quite an interesting environment to, to work in from a mobility perspective. Great. Emma, have you got anything that you can add to that? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question, this one actually. Um, I've 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 come I've come across this quite often because we we often do things on my projects on, on Crossrail 1 and Crossrail 2 where they are quite complicated to do in London. And I, I tend to think, well, perhaps that wouldn't be so difficult if we were just doing this somewhere else, like in Cornwall. Um, and, you know, for example, digging a tunnel in the ground to put a railway underground. Um, there is so much stuff in the ground in London you would not believe. <laughs> so, so every time you see a tall building, this, that sort of building is likely to be on a, on a foundation that's called a piled foundation. And basically what it is is a bunch of concrete columns plunging into the ground meters and meters, like, you know, 40 meters down. And you can't dig a tunnel through that, so you have to go around. And, you know, all of this is a constraint on your project. It's something you have to take in, into consideration. So sometimes, you know, you might look at the underground map and think, um, and think, why is that that tube line squiggling about all over the place? Well, it's probably doing it because there's something in the way that it can't go through. <laughs> and um, I like I like to think you wouldn't have this problem if you, you know, decided to dig a tunnel in the ground in Devon or Cornwall, but then you'd have other issues. So I'm sure, for example, you know, you'll have heard about projects like HS2, where they have lots of issues where, you know, they're, they're building railways through areas of outstanding natural beauty instead. And, you know, there's not so many areas of outstanding natural beauty in London. 
<laughs> although you know a few architects might disagree with you um and and that's the thing in for, for hs2 they're building through the countryside so you know what they're removing to build their railway things like trees and what we'd be removing to build our railway in a, in a place like london would be existing buildings um so it's 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 dif it's it's different challenges and i i've given you a, a bit of a flavor there of the, the sort of stuff i run into there's there's loads of other things like uh like logistics like getting materials to sites and just the proximity of um of stakeholders to sites so you know if you imagine you you set up a construction site in central london you might have 300 people overlooking the site in the in the block of flats next to you and you know you could be building on that site for a decade and all these people could be listening to the noise from your building site from a decade for a decade so you have to you have to take all that into account and think well well what do we do about it how do we make the situation more tolerable for people because ultimately we we do need to build this railway for the benefit of london but how do we make it better for people um so yeah that's that's my thoughts on that yeah, so I completely agree about the, the, the tunnels and we're left with um, a number of the tunnels that were built uh, have been dug in through through London have been uh, have been built over a, a huge time span. Um, we've been running tube trains for a long time in London. And so an interesting thing that that has meant is that actually the tunnels, some of them are very small. And so some of the tube trains have to be have to fit obviously to go down those tunnels and so uh so th these trains are relatively unique because they have to squash all of that equipment and all of that those your motors and your air compressors and your um your wheels and your axles and your space for your seating you have to squash all of that comp all of those components into a very very small space and that causes uh, that causes when you're designing the train and then when you're looking after it, as, as I do, um, lots of difficulties because you, you just don't have a lot of space in your, in your, on your train. So I think that's quite unique about, about London um, because you have quite, you have quite small trains um, and that causes lots, lots, of, lots of difficulties when we, uh, when we have a problem. Um, I can think of something specifically that I've, I've worked on and uh, you know we, we had to remove a, a, a portion of the underframe from underneath the train and it was very very difficult to to get into that space because there was sort of you know, clambering over almost sort of other bits of equipment having to remove other pieces that creates lots of lots of problems when you start removing things takes a lot more time um, so it, it's uh, <laughs> that's a that's a challenge you wouldn't necessarily have in London, but as as Emma's pointed out, you you have other other challenges maybe in the countryside. Brilliant, thank you, Ambassador. So that was an amazing response. They they had they are doing my job for me. These ambassadors aren't they? So I think something that's really um, they've all picked up on is this idea that with anywhere london has its own unique set of challenges when you're building so the great thing about london is it's very easy which can be a really good thing because you know your service is going to get really well used which is great because you can kind of go great so it's going to be sustainable financially in that respect however being incredibly busy and in an incredibly um close city so a very a lot of people in a small amount of space makes just Holding things logistically incredibly hard and actually I just want us to think about when the London Underground was originally built now um, I talked about this a little bit in my other ambassador interview the London Underground was the first underground railway in the entire world so it was it was a bit of a risk it was a bit of a let's see if this works um, and the way they originally built the tunnel was they followed lines of roads and we still did this today so I think it was Disney maybe you know it was Emma who talked about the some of the tube lines you're going very wiggly and round corners and it's a bit odd it's because you're trying to follow the line of the road because that way you build under the road you're not going to risk damage to the buildings around it and you're not having to pay to go underneath obviously private companies building you can go under the road it's much easier however the way they originally built the tube was they had to dig up the road Build the tunnel, cover it back up again. This was a nightmare. It's a method called cut and cover. And as you can imagine, that causes huge disruptions, especially 
actually when we were building sort of the underground in the you know the mid to late 1800s and it's it's a city it's crowded you're now picking up main roads nightmare we can really see how engineers have really taken a problem of how do you build in a busy place like london you used to use cut and cover what we do now is we use big tunnel boring machines and what that does mean is you're going to cause far far less disruption to everyone you know going about their business in the city than using the cut and cover method so you can really see that engineers never resting on their laurels they come up with a solution then constantly trying to improve on that solution. Now, I think it'd be really good if we start looking at this idea of sustainability. So sustainability is obviously becoming a much bigger concern for all of us. We know that we're in a bit of a climate crisis and we all need to be doing our part. So ambassadors, what I wanna ask you first of all, is how has this growing concern about sustainability changed the way you work and changed what you are doing on your projects. So let's start off with Ben for this one. Yeah, so I this is it's a really it's a really difficult problem to to solve. I think that there's no way to um uh there, there's no sort of need to the, the this problem when um uh, something that often comes up when you're repairing trains is that it's actually cheaper to throw away lots of components and replace them with new, um, putting lots of things in the bin um, because it's very expensive to repair uh, certain components, especially when you've, you've got trains that were built back in 1970, 1980, then it can often, uh, often you just want to throw them all in the bin and, and, and replace with new because that is so much cheaper and so much uh, easier. So I think the the biggest change that i've seen in my career so far is is just uh, an increase in that conversation of well it, it, there's there's not just it's not just about finance and it's not just about what's easiest and what's best to do um to to, to meet your project deadline or your uh or, or or that timeline and it's it's also the an environmental impact of well if we put all of these motors in the bin or we put all of those wheels in the bin then, then what is the um what's the environmental impact of that um so i think that's probably the shift that i've seen over the last over the last five years that's played a much bigger role in how we decide to um to repair trains for my part but i'm sure that's that's very similar across across the board for in other industries Great. Disney, do you want to um, pick up and say how it's affected the areas that you're working in? Yeah, I think I echo a lot of what Ben has just talked about because it's it's a very hard problem to fix. <laughs> um, has why I think we need support from different types across the different parts that make up the mobility sector. Um, for Siemens, obviously, we we interface with a lot of different parts of that mobility and public transport piece so we're looking at more sustainable more green ways on which we power our vehicles um, also looking at providing different options as well to drive people away from using uh, their private vehicles for example um, yeah I, for one, love going on the tube, but I know that's not sort of the preferred method for everyone. So how can we offer different sustainable uh, transport options for people so that um, they are less reliant on their car and they can use cycling, um, e-scooters and other different modes of transport that are greener. Uh, I think there's also uh, advances in technologies that help us uh, reduce energy consumption as well on trains, for example, where they're using coasting rather than sort of just going at full speed to, to reach the destination, but reaching the destination at a still punctual time, but using less energy to get there. So there's a lot of different ways and tweaks that we could all do to play a part in, in sustainability. But I think it's um, it's a team effort. It, it can't just be, you know, amendments to the train or amendments to the signaling system. To play together and fit in, in like one big jigsaw puzzle, because 
it's it's sort of useless reducing energy consumption of the train if then as ben said you know you're just throwing away the equipment and 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 um yeah so yeah it's it's a tough nut to crack but i'm sure that we're you know being aware of it is the first step uh striving from both a supply chain and also from a customer point of view to to try and resolve it is is the only way that we can fix it together for the next generation really great emma have you got anything um because obviously you're working on quite a big yeah it has a huge environment you know it's very nature has a huge impact so maybe you can talk a little bit about how you manage it as you're as you're doing that project yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out, Lauren, because actually, you know, Disney and Ben have made really great points there. Um, and, you know, we try and take all those into consideration when we are designing future projects like Crossrail too. So, for example, about, you know, making sure trains slow down naturally, naturally and accelerate naturally, we can influence that as engineers by designing our tunnels so that each of the stations they're kind of on a little hill underground so the trains naturally slow down as they arrive in the station and then they naturally speed up as they depart the station to save energy but again you sort of as, as kind of disney said that's that's kind of on a small individual scale but what we as large magic mega projects like crossrail 2 have started doing is you know we need to be thinking decades in the future is how how should we be managing this sort of stuff and actually the approach we're kind of moving towards is if you think about what we do when we when we build these mega projects is we we make an assessment of how much they would cost to build so we we know how much it costs to buy the trains we know about how much it costs to build the tunnels you know we we know these costs and what we've started to do is think well okay well what does it cost in terms of carbon to build this to build this railway what does it cost in terms of carbon to operate this railway and obviously if we're if we're throwing bits away well that's a higher carbon cost than if we'd found a way of recycling them and if we're if we're building trains um, that come into stations that are on hills that's a lower carbon cost than if we didn't do that but what we're trying to do is for the whole project do come up with a carbon cost so that any time we make a change to the project we know if we've improved the carbon cost or if we've made it worse um, and the other important thing to think about which you which you kind of um, I think Disney kind of touched upon this is um, is trying to get people to understand the carbon cost of using different modes of transport because ultimately the carbon cost of using Crossrail 2 will always be lower than using a private vehicle and that it doesn't even matter if that vehicle will be electric in the future because Crossrail will be electric too <laughs> but it's a much more efficient use of resources to move people around than using a private vehicle and and I, I think as Disney said it's it's about awareness you know we're moving through this period of increasing awareness and I think what we all need to do is challenge ourselves do we understand the carbon cost as well as the actual money cost of everything we do because if we don't understand that then we can't make decisions to improve it so that's what we as mega projects are trying to do make sure we understand that and we communicate it and we make decisions accordingly so that we go forwards and improve our sustainability and we don't go backwards so yeah that's what, that's what we're doing lauren <laughs> hope that helps just that little thing that's all they're doing you know just considering the future and everything uh, no that was an, those were amazing answers and again so much to pick up on from what our ambassadors have just said so i think uh, one of the things i really want to pick up on is i think um, in disney especially made a really good point about i think a lot of us when we think about sustainability and looking after the environment we think about almost more from where um emma's coming out emma starts a, a new project so you're kind of you're building things from scratch partly it's kind of easier in some ways to make them sustainable and more environmentally because you're, you're starting from new so you can build all that stuff in right from the start however as i said it's like the london underground there you know, parts of it are 100 and over 150 years old. So what becomes a lot trickier is looking at how do you deal with kind of things like that? How do you deal with much older things? Or how do you deal with, like Ben said, it is much cheaper to throw certain things away than it is to try and repair them. So we've kind of created a 
and on a worldwide scale this isn't just and this isn't just the transport industry this is all industries we've created kind of just a disposable if you like a disposable economy but oftentimes it's a lot easier to throw something away and buy a new one it is to try and repair the one you have. However, that means you're having to use more natural resources. You're having to transport those things, which is releasing a load more carbon. So you can see what engineers are really kind of up against is they are not just having to consider my project and how I put it. They're having to consider things like finances, like how things are done and how do you start challenging that thinking and I think that's really really key and that's something that you the viewers as future engineers are going to have to be considering more and more and more and it's good that we are considering them um, because it actually means we, we are challenging the fact that it shouldn't be cheaper to throw away and get a new one it should you know we should be making it much easier to repair what we already have another point I want to bring up I think Emma's really summed up nicely is engineers, I would actually argue that the main job of an engineer is to influence people's behaviour, because like Emma said, you know, um, especially in London, for example, the main thing you're trying to achieve is less cars on the road and more people on public transport. And that's really about trying to change people's behaviour, which is an incredibly hard thing to do. And again, I don't think we think of that when we think of engineers building buildings or, you know, creating transport. But that is what they're trying to do. And I think that's a really exciting part of being an engineer is we're trying to work out how do I challenge what people do because it's easy or because it's what they've always done. How do I actually make, you know, try and help them make a big of how they behave and how they interact with you know the transport systems around them so I think they've brought up some great points there now I'm just aware we're running out of time so the last thing I want to do I want to bring the focus back to you the viewers because as I said you're going to be our engineers of the future you're the ones going to be tackling these big problems so STEM ambassadors the last thing I want to ask you is what would you say well, few engineers, you know, what words of encouragement or or what kind of things would you give them to think about? What would you want to say to them if you were here in the room with us now? So let's start with Disney. What would you say to our future engineers? Um, not to blow uh, engineers on trumpet, but I think engineers are sort of silent superheroes. Um, I think we all play a very small part in changing tomorrow's future uh, you know uh, every sort of mega project as Emma said you know it's not just about fixing today's problem but this is a solution for today tomorrow and beyond uh, so if if you want to play a part in fixing issues whether it's in public transport or whether it's in other industries because engineering is so versatile in, in its own nature um, this is really a very nice career path for you. Um, it's, it's just so creative and it just offers so many different uh, breadth of opportunities on how you can just change someone's life by improving something that is impeding them for going about their day in a very natural manner, if that makes sense. So yeah, I hope today's session was interesting. I hope it's opened eyes to what is out there and what is possible and how we can all contribute to make the world a better, more accessible place for public transport and other industries that we all need to survive and strive. Great. And do you want to answer that question for me? I think that was me. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, what I would say to everyone listening to this is whether or not you de decide to become an engineer, and obviously please do, because as, as Disney has said, being an engineer is great, um, challenge the status quo. And what that means is, you know, we can't reduce the carbon impact of this thing because, oh, it's too expensive. You say, well, well, how could we make it cheaper? How could we make it work? You know, if saying oh well we have to drive because it's so it's so convenient it's so convenient you know you you have to challenge them and say well well what is the cost that's being paid of the decision that you're making here to choose to drive instead of use public transport there's always a hidden cost you know if those clothes are really really cheap where is the cost being paid on the planet 
to make those clothes that cheap. And surely wouldn't it be better for those clothes to be slightly more expensive, but with a lower carbon impact? So always remember, you know, there's the money cost and then there's the carbon cost. And those two things have to be in balance. And at the moment, they're not. And that's where we have to get to in the future. And you guys can help us with that by always, always questioning and challenging people when they say things can't be done. So I'd say that's the most important thing from my point of view. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant summary. I, I won't do any better than that. Um, so, uh, so I think, um, first of all, sign up, because I think engineering is the most exciting topic to, to, to study and, and learn about. And I think probably Disney and Emma have covered more sort of outward looking, sort of really important things, the way that you can improve the world, but from a maybe just think more inwards for yourself, then I think it's just, it's a really interesting um, thing to learn about. And it gives you the opportunity to, if you go and work in cars or, or in trains or in planes, it gives you that fantastic opportunity to learn how all of those all of those things work. I mean, how does a tunnel boring machine work? I mean, I don't know, I don't work in that environment, but I would be really interested to go and find out how it did work. Um, and I get to I get the opportunity to to learn how trains work, and I and I really enjoy that um, on a on a daily basis. So it's a it's a fantastic excuse to go and learn about about really interesting things. So. Uh, that's from a probably a very inward looking point of view, but driving uh, for a for you know a better um, a, a better place, and that's what engineers can can do as well. But, um, but yeah, back to you, Lauren. Brilliant. Well, that was so good, and that is all we've got time for today. I want to say a huge thank you to my three ambassadors. I think we can all agree they've been amazing and. Uh, Maybe want to go out and change the world now. It's been very inspiring. So hopefully it's inspired you at home as well. And um, we can't wait to see you at the museum again. Hopefully soon. Everyone keep your fingers crossed. Um, and for more information about the key stage three events that we will be running, uh, go to the schools section of our website and we are hoping to be running events in June. So hopefully we will see you really soon. Otherwise, have a lovely rest of your day, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us. Goodbye.